Is there any further discussion? Senator Marty. Madam President, this weekend I was in the office for a conference committee and I decided to spend a few minutes listening to some of the constituent voicemails that we have that pile up on our phones at times. And one woman who had a beautiful southern accent um, told me that her religious beliefs, it was very clear she had very strong, sincere feelings, persuaded her that same-sex marriage was wrong and she was very passionate about it. She went on to say that because of her religious beliefs and her disagreement with same-sex marriage, she said she couldn't comply with the law. She said she simply couldn't comply with the law. She said, if they have to arrest me, they'll just have to do that. And I was hoping she would leave her name and number, and I waited till the end of the message to get it so I could call her back, but she didn't. Because it really sounded like she truly believed that she was going to be forced to marry another woman by this legislation. And the reality is, the point she made in saying she didn't want to comply with the law is it doesn't affect her. It doesn't affect her family. It doesn't affect her church. It doesn't affect her religious beliefs. And of course, it doesn't require her to marry any particular person. She has the right to her very sincere religious beliefs, as she ought to, and this bill doesn't change that. It doesn't change it in any way, shape, or form. But just as she has a right to those religious beliefs, those religious beliefs should not be used to determine how other people live their lives, who they choose to fall in love with, who they fall choose to marry. 32 years ago now, I met and fell in love with Connie, and I'm a very lucky person. We made a commitment to ourselves a year later we made a commitment in front of our church, in our church, in front of our family and friends. Now we've had over three decades, blessed with a wonderful family, two kids, both of whom called home, one from India called home to wish her a happy Mother's Day yesterday. For over three decades, we've seen how important family and marriage is. My father is a Lutheran pastor and theologian he and my mother raised me with the understanding of the importance of family and commitment. And after three decades, I gotta say I agree with them, they were right, I strongly support that. About 15 years ago, one of my father's students in divinity school fell in love with a wonderful woman who was also in seminary at the time. The two of them also made a commitment in their church, in front of their family and their friends, now they're both ministers. They've been blessed with a charming three-year-old daughter. That girl loves her parents the same way our kids love theirs. They share my values about love, about marriage, about family. They care about their family rights and their ability to take care of each other. But unfortunately, while they have the same love and concern and family that we have, until this week, our state has not given them any recognition because they're both women. Their daughter doesn't have the right to know that her parents are protected if one of them is in an accident. They don't even have right now all the legal rights to visit each other. And in many cases, many rights such as they have been denied. They're denied the benefits of our joint filing and tax returns and other things like that. But the bottom line is our state doesn't recognize them as a legal family. This legislation is so incredibly important to that family and to every family that's been denied the rights under the state until now. This legislation will finally, this week, will change all of that and will give them the same recognition that my wife and I have, and most of the people in this room have. The same recognition, nothing more and nothing less. And these families, whether some have been able to acknowledge it or not, these families, they pay taxes. They participate in their communities. 
They go to church. They're active in the PTA. These families deserve the same rights and recognition that we do. And I think it's fair to say there have been a lot of people in this building today, a lot of people here who've been working for and fighting for this for several decades now. And it's finally happening. And I think that's a beautiful day. And I'm really proud of the people of Minnesota. And I'm very happy and honored for them. And I urge all of you to join us in showing our support and recognition for those families who we care about and who deserve the same protection that all of us have. Thank you very much. Senator Nelson. Thank you, Madam President. Members, we've met here today to debate a centuries-old institution, one of great importance to our state and our society, marriage. I respect the fact that societal views on marriage have changed and they are rapidly evolving. My constituents are like Minnesotans all across the state. They're deeply divided on this important issue. I've received many visitors, phone calls, emails, and letters, some in opposition to this bill, some in support of this bill. I've read, I've listened to each and every one. I've formed new friendships in the process, and I count it as a great honor and privilege to be their senator in the Senate for this time. Now, members, this bill is intended to advance marriage rights. And this bill, as we've discussed, is intended to provide exemptions based on religious associations and to protect religious doctrine and religious belief. These exemptions and protections are found in sections one and section five of the bill that we have before us today. But members, it is the next section, section six, entitled Relationship to Other Law, that causes me pause. It is expressly stated in this section that the exemptions and protections to protect religious doctrine and belief do not, I repeat, do not apply to religious associations, religious corporations, and nonprofits providing adoptions, foster care, or social services if they receive public funds. Members, this bill denies right of a different opinion. We must respect religious freedom at the same time that we advance rights. This bill does not do that. While advancing the rights of some, this bill denies the rights of others in the process. Senator Hayden. Thank you. <clears throat> well, thank you, Madam President. And um, I uh, obviously, or to most, would know that I am very supportive of this bill. I uh, have heard from my constituents and most uh, as the notes have come to flow into the to the, to, the, to the room that we're in here today are in favor of this. But let me just tell you a little bit about why this is such a big deal and a big issue for me. Many of you uh, who I've served with know that I'm pretty proud of my family. Uh, my wife, Terry, and I have been married for over 15 years. Uh, we have two children that I'm proud of. I, my son, Tomas, went to the prom this year. And, I sent that out on Twitter and Facebook, and, and I'm sure he's happy that I'm talking about him today, but I am proud of him. And today, my daughter Sophia went off to camp, environmental camp with her school, and I was able to give her a big hug. Uh, and she told me today that it was going to be a, a, a big day, and she would hope and, 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 re, and told me to remember to vote yes. And the reason why I say that, members, is that my children have been around people who are in same-sex relationships their entire life. They have, they know Scott and Richard, they know Karen and Jackie, 
They know Susan and Amber, those are members of this great body. They talk to them, they have campaigned with them, and they are great children, and I think because they've met them, they're even better children. I don't think that they have had a negative effect on their lives because of that. And so when I think about my children and I think about the work, I was talking to Senator Champion the other day, and his son Miles and Jalen have had the same experiences. We find that that has enhanced their life, that they've been able to be around people that live the same and different lifestyles as their parents. So members, I think that some of the things that I think members that people worry about because of maybe how they were raised or maybe their deeply held religious beliefs, I would just say that I think it's going to be okay. I think that hopefully when we pass this bill in a few minutes, in a few hours, that you will find that next year when we come back here that everything is going to be okay in Minnesota and that people are going to be fine and that we'll find something else to disagree about, but this won't be one of them. Members, I'm going to leave you with June 1958, there was a couple in Virginia. It's the, it's, it's the loving couple that got married. It was a, a white man and an African-American woman. woman. They lived in Virginia, but because Virginia had the laws that says that they could not marry, they went to Washington, D.C. to get married. The couple, the woman was pregnant and they wanted to make sure that their child was born in a loving relationship that was married. They went to D.C. and got married, Washington, D.C. And upon their arrival back in Virginia, because it was against the law, he was arrested. It was a felony at that time in the South and even places in the West for interracial relationships, for people who have different races to get our ethnicities to get married. Now, I think what I neglected to tell you earlier is that my wife is white. So I think about that, and they fought that case, and Senator Cohen and Senator Lapson, and Senator Champion and other attorneys who have studied this can tell you a lot more about it and the intricacies of what happened. But eventually, the Supreme Court said that we have to stop this, that we cannot continue to treat people unequal, that this couple should be married, and that they should go on and live forward in their life. And so I think about that in relationship to me, that if those laws were still on the books, that I would not have Terry, who is wonderful, is one of the reasons why I'm here. Tomas would not necessarily be here or necessarily be thriving. And Sophia, I wouldn't have been able to give a hug and a kiss to as she went to camp today. And so I say this in summary, members, I know that this is a change for some of you. But once again, we have gone through this process and I think that we're at the end of the road to make sure that there's equity with every loving and committed relationship, not only in this state, but hopefully in this country. So I would urge you, I would urge you to think deeply about the things that I've said today and others. Think deeply about your commitment to your family. And please, please, vote yes, it will be okay. Senator Ingebrigtsen. Thank you, Madam President and members. And to Senator Hayden, I, uh, my good friend, Senator Hayden, who talks about family and love of family and, and his children who are involved with friends and, and, uh, and we all have that, members, we all do. And, and at the end of the day, Senator Hayden, you say, we'll come back to this body after this bill passed, and there's no question in my mind that it will, that we will all be okay. Members, I'm still somewhat concerned. I'm concerned about my family. I have two wonderful kids, six beautiful grandkids, and I'm, I'm very concerned for them and I say them, the younger ones, uh, recently born uh, Jillian, who's now just a little over one year, who's going to be coming home from school, I think, in the, in the future. And, you know, I don't know, that, I don't know that confused is the right word. I think that's probably an unkind word. I, I, there's going to be some questions. There's going to be some questions on, 
on family and family traditions and what about this and what about that? And, and my fear is that we haven't covered this clearly enough that those answers are gonna be able to just come right off the end of my tongue. And I say that, members, because for over thousands of years we've recognized the family unit as that between one man and one woman for thousands, literally thousands of years. And I'd be remiss if I didn't get up and at least mention my district that I represent. I think you all know where I'm gonna vote. I've been it very clear. Uh, but I also do represent a bunch of folks. In fact, the numbers are, are you know, quite a, bit, quite a bit higher than the, I would say, the seven county metro ring inclusive. Uh, my Senate district voted in favor of the constitutional amendment to define marriage by 65% District 8. I should also mention that the congressional district that I am in, congressional district number seven, was 63%, 63% thought that it would be just, it would be good to recognize traditional marriage in the Constitution as that between a man and a woman. So I'm not going to, uh, I'm not gonna get into any more of of uh, what about this and what about that and how okay we're all gonna be. I'm not quite so sure that everything is gonna be just okay. Um, that's why I ask members to continue to recognize the core traditional marriage that we have for thousands of years. And I respectfully ask, I respectfully, respectfully ask this body to vote against this bill. Thank you. Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Madam President. Members, today we gather uh, in this great chamber, the People's Chamber, to discuss and, and make a historical decision. I first want to say that I've respected members uh, by the views, points from folks to, to rightly disagree or agree. But publicly, this is the heart of the Constitution, Madam President, with this great state and country. Uh, today we have a choice. It's a choice for equality, civil rights, a choice for fairness, a choice for stronger families and communities, and a choice for individuals to finally marry the person they love. To do anything less is to continue the pain of, of exclusion. And I've seen it and felt it in my own heart. My sister, who has been in a 16-year committed relationship with her partner, we've watched at family weddings, tears of happiness for the couple, yet tears of pain because she is not considered whole, considered viable, are considered equal to the person to stand up in front of those that she loves and publicly say that I do. Today we must do the right thing, members. This is a stepping stone for equality for all individuals. There's still a segment of society, people with disabilities, that must petition the commissioner of the Department of Human Services to marry. There's still a segment of the society that gets hit every time they, they want to marry because their Social Security Administration SSDI income gets lowered. So this is the right step in the right direction, Madam President. We have nothing to fear from love and commitment, and we have only everything to gain. So members, please vote yes today. Thank you. Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you, Madam President. Um, certainly all of us have family members, as I do, and as I have lived my life, I have honored that and respected them as a family member. I do a family list for both sides of the family, and everybody is included. I live that out and practice that. But as I have told them, this is a matter of public law. And as we take a look at what is actually written in this language, I'm reminded of last fall before the constitutional amendment and folks were told on TV, radio and other ways as well that it was okay to vote no because nothing would change. They were told it is okay to vote no because nothing would change. Do they feel betrayed today? Absolutely. Do they feel lied to? Yeah, because they were told nothing would change. So here we are today with a massive change. 
understanding that we have these changes, that is true. And so the bill is before us. But as we try to put in here some First Amendment protections, the rights of an individual First Amendment being rebuffed and being turned down, as if somehow we cannot have both. That is not true. But it is also sad once again here today to say, it's okay, it'll just be okay, really. In every other state, in every other country, we have not seen that to be the case, in fact, in law, and in court cases. So that is the reality. And so our efforts here in regards to the law that is actually in front of us to making our positions known to be clear, that I'm able to stand here today in support of traditional marriage as one man and one woman, and my ability to say so here on the Senate floor. But my fear and my concern that for other people, as they go about their daily business in Minnesota, will not have that individual right. And that, to me, is a sad day. Madam President, I'm voting no on this bill because of the lack of First Amendment protections and because I believe marriage, one man, one woman, and their capacity for having children is the best public policy. Thank you. Senator Jensen. Thank you, Madam President. I rise in support of this bill. As I run for, ran for office, I was um, faced with, as we all were, the constitutional amendment, which is com different than what we're talking about today. But what I shared with everyone that I spoke with is that I could never and would never deny the kind of um, recognition and things that I get out of the relationship I have with my husband to anyone else. But I also made a commitment that I would listen, that I would research, that I would do everything I could on every issue that I was faced with up here at the Capitol. So I appreciate those conversations that I had, and I appreciate the respect that that communication between everyone um, had as well. During my research, the thing that brought more clarity to me is the summary that was provided in the Barnum versus Bryan case. It was a unanimous decision at the Iowa Supreme Court. It was dated April 3rd, 2009. They had to look at the state's limitation of marriage for opposite sex couples whether or not it violated the Equal Protection Clause in their Constitution. As they addressed that case and looked at those issues, that court found that at the heart of what was going on and the principle was the doctrine of equal protection. Even though it may be supported with very, very strong and deep-seated traditional values and beliefs, that was their opinion, and that's my opinion as well. State government can have no religious views, whether directly or indirectly, expressed through its legislation, and that's what I'm looking at. This is a piece of legislation. To me, that is the essence of the separation of church and state. They also found that as a result, civil marriage must be judged under the constitutional standards of equal protection, not under religious doctrines or other religious views of the individuals. That approach does not disrespect or dis denigrate the religious views that people hold, that, that they hold as their foundation for why we're here. But it considers, and the only thing that I'm considering here, is that the constitutional rights of all people, as expressed in our Constitution, must be upheld. And that's what I'll do today. And I hope that the members of this body will vote green as well for that. Thank you. Senator Reinert. Uh, thank you, Madam President. I'm, uh, you know, I started early this session and actually continued throughout the session telling lots of folks, I had a member in the back room say, you know, Duluthians are probably all on one side of this. And I said, no, Duluthians are not all on one side of this. And while I have a strong personal opinion on it, throughout the session I didn't share that. 
Uh, all the way up through last night, we were on uh, Northeastern Minnesota uh, legislators were on uh, kind of our version of Almanac North last night and a caller called in and asked, how's Senator Reiner going to vote? And I said, tune in tomorrow. Um, because I felt it was really important that while I had a strong personal opinion, people felt comfortable sharing their own because whatever decision is made in this body today, it's going to be a big decision and it's going to affect a lot of strongly felt beliefs by many. But for me as a civics teacher, I sort of want to go back a little bit, back to July 4th, 1776, the Declaration of Independent, Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, and I'm going to editorialize a little bit here, that all women and men are created equal, and that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And here's where you get a little bit of a classroom lecture fr uh, from me on this. You know, Jefferson got these words from a number of different sources. One included John Locke. One uh, uh, passage of Locke uh, is that the highest perfection of intellectual nature lies in a careful and constant pursuit of true and public happiness. As a result, the original Declaration of Independence draft actually inc included the, the phrase pursuit of public happiness. The reflection on that was that the con was the concept that the only true form of happiness is public happiness, that our self-interests and rights are most properly understood within the context of the self-interests and rights of those around us, the public. But as fate would have it, Ben Franklin being the consummate uh, editor said something like this, Tom, everyone knows the only true form of happiness is public happiness, so get rid of that redundant modifier, and the word public was struck from the draft of the uh, Declaration of Independence. But for me, that's an important preface for today's uh, conversation, or at least the way I think about it. You know, yesterday, of course, was Mother's Day, and I gave my mom a call. I live in Duluth. They live down here in the cities. In fact, mom and dad are watching, so just want to say hello to them. You know, in fact, they live in Senator Limmer's district, and I've encouraged, I know he's come by, and um, I've, been, I've encouraged them to answer the door when he does. <laughs> They're not extremely political people. In fact, I think the only yard sign they've had was mine, which uh, Senator Limmer explained to his wife was not of, of concern to him that they had my yard sign in their yard. Um, but as we talked about today, uh, as, we, as Mom and I talked yesterday, she asked about today. And she said she had hoped that she had taught me to be tolerant, accepting, and not ju judgmental. And then she asked how I was going to vote. Now, they've never asked, I don't think, uh, how I was going to vote on anything. You know, they might clip out the Star Tribune if I make it in there. Um, they might talk about something. My dad likes to talk about the Viking Stadium project. Um, but they've never asked how I was going to vote on something. And as I said, I know they're watching today along with my sister Simone. And I just want to say that I love you both. And then I know you're going to be proud of me today. Now, what my mom was referring to was not this issue, directly anyways, when she talked about teaching me to be tolerant, accepting, and not judgmental. Some of you know because you've had the chance to meet some of my family. I have a unique family. I have five adopted sisters that come from around the world. All are non-white. Last fall, when we were kicking off the Vote No campaign in Duluth, they went, we ran around and shared stories, personal stories about why this issue was important to us. And not surprisingly, many shared a story about a loved one or a person of concern to them who was gay. Well, mine was about my sister, Simone. 50 years ago, this would have been about the color of her skin. 100 years ago, it would have been about her sex, her gender. Today, I believe it's the same decision, the same discussion about civil rights, but based on someone's sexual orientation. Now, each time the, our country has reached this decision point, this crucible in history, we have come out on the right side of history, and we have been a stronger country for it. Now, probably I'm not alone in this chamber, and having really liked the movie Lincoln that came out earlier this year. I saw it, I think, five or six times in the theater. Um, that's a lot for me to see one movie. And I actually saw it again when uh, Randy Boland, who's the mayor of Two Harbors, a friend of mine, had a private screening in his garage when the DVD first came out. 
Now, there are a lot of great lines and a lot of favorite scenes in that movie, but one that bothered me every single time I saw it was the scene where President Lincoln comes back to the White House. He's greeted by his servant, Elizabeth Keckley, and they have a conversation about how will the country change. And she asks the president what his thoughts are. And President Lincoln, as portrayed in the movie, says, you know, you're familiar to me as all people are. Unaccommodated, poor, bare creatures such as we all are. You have a right to expect what I expect. And likely, our expectations are not incomprehensible to each other. I assume I'll get used to you. I'm a big reflector, and as I thought about my comments today, I really kind of dug into why that scene always bothered me. I think what it bothered me about it was I wanted the president to be perfect. I wanted President Lincoln, as portrayed in this movie, to be above that, to be better than that, to have no imperfections. And of course, member, members, the reality is the real president wasn't, the president as he was portrayed in the movie wasn't, and we're not. We're imperfect, we are fallible, we all need grace, we all need forgiveness. Earlier, Senator Marty, you talked about marriage, and you talked about most people in this room referencing the fact that most members of the Senate are married. I happen to be one of the single members of the Senate. And to be married is something that I still very much desire in my own life. To find that person who will choose to love me, who will choose to spend a lifetime with me. And as I search, search my core beliefs and convictions, I find that I want those same dreams and desires for anyone. Many folks have already found that, in many cases for decades. Expanding rights to them does nothing to diminish mine. Validating their dreams and desires only serves to give me more hope for my own. You have the right to expect what I expect, and likely our expectations are not incomprehensible to each other. And so I vote today to give something that is not really mine to give. I'm only a functionary. I happen to be a person in the right place and the right time in the history of our state and country. I vote today to recognize for all the very same desires I have for myself. I vote today to ratify for all the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of public happiness. Thank you, Madam President. Senator Lorry. Thank you, Madam President. I rise in support of House File 1054. You know, today, is a very special day here. We're seven days from the end of the session. This is a time that gets to be very tense around this body and around the Capitol and very um, difficult to maneuver. It becomes hard to get outside ourselves at times and see that we're really trying to um, do well by the people of Minnesota and move our state forward. And, and I myself have been guilty of of not being able to see that sometimes. It's been, uh, you know, a very busy, hardworking, at times frustrating session. Um, but this morning, walking up the Capitol steps felt really, really good. Today is one of those days, one of those rare days, where we get to make a real and meaningful difference in people's lives and give them the recognition that they deserve. And it renews my faith in our state and our institutions to see beyond the day that we're in today and really look to how uh, history will view us as we move forward. You know, at the core of the debate today is love. Um, I, I'm not going to be able to define love. Uh, I'm going to leave that to the artists and the authors and the poets. Um, but I'm lucky enough to experience it, and I understand it through that. Um, but exactly how two people come together and, and form that bond and that commitment to each other, I, you know, I'm not going to wax poetic on it. It's it just there. So then, beyond love, it becomes marriage. So what is, what is marriage? What is it that we're working toward here? It's, it's definitely about that love. 
and it's about commitment between two loving people. And at the very core of it, it's very hard work. I've been married 20 years. There's, you know, we, we told each other, we all tell each other, there's going to be good times, there's going to be bad times, and we need to make it through them all. We get the celebrations, and we get the hard work, and together we form a bond that can make it. It's about rights and responsibilities. It's about duties and privileges. And it's also about um, making those promises and, and having a ceremony where those promises are celebrated in front of faith and in front of family and hold us to our commitments to those that we love. And when you boil it down to that, when it comes to the state defining our civil rights and our civil liberties and, and who gets to partake in them, I, I mean, I can come to no other conclusion but that our civil institutions have to be open and accessible to every single Minnesotan. And by making sure of this, that everyone has access to those civil institutions that we define in our state laws, we strengthen the institution of marriage. We strengthen our bonds by embracing the diversity that exists in our society. So in the end, you know, even though I can't define it with pre precision, I can't put words around it, in my heart of hearts, I know that today love wins. Senator Eaton. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I will be brief. My colleagues have spoken very eloquently about the civil rights involved in our decision today and about the pain and cost of discrimination at when someone is treated inequitably with the pain of economic inequality, quality of life, um, the freedoms and options, and all the things that go with discrimination. I feel very blessed to be able to be here to vote to turn that corner on this issue. To, I get to be part of history, to give people the right that I have. I will celebrate my 32nd wedding anniversary next month. And I am so grateful for that, and I hope that um, this brings a lot of happiness like that to a lot of people who haven't had that opportunity up until now, at least in the state of Minnesota. So I strongly support House File 1054, and I do urge a green vote. Thank you. Senator Westrom. Madam President. I've done a little uh, research uh, over the weekend. There's not too many of us that were here in 1997. What was significant in 1997? Before that, Madam President, members, our state statutes didn't define marriage between one man and one woman because they didn't have to. 1997, a couple of courts had started dealing with this issue, construing the constitution of a state to say that it has to recognize marriage between same-sex couples. This legislature took a vote and passed legislation to write into law what had never been in question before in this state because it didn't need to be. There's about five members in this Senate that supported that legislation to define marriage in our statute between one man and one woman. Here we are just 16 years later, taking that statute out, getting rid of this long standing tradition 
that our state has recognized since creation that children need a dad and a mom, a male and a female, It's hard to believe in just 16 years after those, that legislation passed overwhelmingly, 54 yes votes in the Senate. I believe it's Senator Limmer, Fishbach, Weger, Stumpf, and Metzen that were here then in the yes category. Members, I hope we all know how significant this day could be if this bill passes. I think there's a lot of unintended consequences. I brought an amendment forward to try to help clarify that, to say at a minimum we're going to set forth that we're not going to take the word mother, father, husband, wife, out of our statutes. And the bill may, doesn't prescribe that. But it reminds me of an article I read last fall, shortly after the election, that in the country of France, they're going through the steps of taking mother and father out of, our sta out of their laws or statutes because of their embracement of same-sex marriage. So members, this legislation, a vote to repeal what happened in 1997 by an overwhelming majority of Democrats and Republicans, is also a vote to go down that road of taking mother and father out of our recognition of what our children need. How is this going to affect the school systems? Who's going to have the right to teach what they want if they are a teacher and they believe in a traditional marriage? Members, I think this is a wrong step in history. A step that we should not be going down. We should affirm what the legislature did in 1997, keep this statute in place, and keep mother and father in marriage. This past weekend, I had the opportunity to talk to different constituents. One of them, asking me for a yes vote on today's bill. Had a nice discussion with them. The question they couldn't answer. Yet I hear it on the ads from last fall that talked about you should be able to marry who you love. That's what marriage is about, who you love. The question I leave you with the question Minnesotans are asking, the question that can't be answered, is if marriage is about marrying who you love, where does that stop? Our statute has several other restrictions of who can get married, but if the premise is you should be able to marry who you love, that is a slippery slope. Vote no on this bill. Senator Hall. Thank you, Madam President. There's a lot of celebrating going on today, but there's also a lot of grieving going on today. Grieving because there are many people in this state that do not believe that this is the right thing to do. I sometimes call this the divine tension our Constitution 
has protections for religious freedom, not to protect the government from religion. I have six key points I'd like to state. First off, marriage exists to bring a man and a woman together as husband and wife, to be the father and mother to any children their union produces. Second, marriage is based on truth that men and women are complementary. The biological fact that reproduction depends on a man and a woman, and the reality that children need both a father and a mother. Which one would you not have wanted? Marriage is society's least restrictive means of ensuring the well-being of children. Marital breakdown weakens civil society. Government recognizes marriage because it benefits society in a way that no other relationship does. Government can treat people equally and with respect and respect their liberty without redefining marriage. Redefining marriage would further distance marriage from the needs of children and deny the importance of mothers and fathers. It'll weaken monogamy, exclusivity, and permanency, the norms to which marriage and our society and it'll threaten religious liberty. I know that, Madam President, you do not allow us to pray in the deity of Jesus or the Holy Spirit while we're up there, but I ask that the Holy Spirit be with all of us today in this capital around Minnesota during this vote. Today, we may be changing the course of freedom for our children and our grandchildren in Minnesota. We may be forced to not just listen to someone else's view, but accept and now legislate, and next, I, will believe, I believe, we will be forced to believe what we don't. I have been accused of attacking, attacking same-sex marriage because I disagree with the lifestyle. When I when disagreeing, I should say, when has disagreeing become an attack? When did taking a stand against something you believe in become a personal attack? Freedom can only be free if we keep our moral compass. If we resolve to strengthen marriage instead of dismantling it, without strong morals, that which we believe is right or wrong, we lose our freedoms. Redefining marriage, which has many restrictions. You can't get married if you're under 18 without parents' permission. Only two people can get married, not three or more, is opening that Pandora's box. If you think marriage If you think marriage the way it is now is discriminating, why not add another group? That's what we've done. We're still discriminating, if that's what you believe, unless we open it up to all. But they'll call me a bigot. They'll call me a hater. They'll spit in my face, like they did a friend of mine last Thursday. There are things in life, members, that are worth standing up for, even to be persecuted for. Many have said to me, Senator Hall, you don't understand. You're married, you live in a nice suburb, you got kids, a nice house, two-car garage, you're well-educated. Most of you don't know. I grew up in the Southeast Projects, 71 St. Mary Street by the U of M. Many of my relatives were addicts, criminals, two sent to prison, more than one child molester, those that my mother tried to keep us away from were relatives. 
My, rather, my mother raised four children in the projects, but I had an alcoholic husband who she divorced when I was six years old. Two years later, she married another, my stepfather, who also was a drunk. At least when he was home, we tried not to be. When I was 12, my mother told him, you either get on your knees and accept Jesus and have him take over your life and stop drinking, or there's the door, don't ever come back. He did that that day. Our life changed. That was a turning point in my history. My father this day, 48 years ago, today, he's now in a nursing home. My mother still lives on Lake Nokomis. But the change of history is like what we're doing today. It will forever change the fate of family. I have family members on both sides of this issue. All of us are not perfect. All of us carry baggage from the past and our families. All have sinned. All have faults. I certainly do. I sin every day. This is not about that. It's about what's good for children. The children here in Minnesota. It's about making the right choice for our children's future. The question is, are homosexual marriages good for our children? Are we as members in this chamber going to change the course of history as to what the adults, we, the caretakers, or public policies holders, leaders of Minnesota, what we think is right for children. Back to marriage. Marriage is about giving, not taking. It's about being willing to serve another, giving your affection to no other. And spiritually, marriage is about two becoming one in God's eyes. A civil union is having a contract to protect yourself from the other that may take advantage of you. Or, and legally, securing the government or civil benefits that have been reserved for marriage. There are consequences to everything. There will be unintended, and I believe intended, consequences. Members, God has written his word on your hearts. Don't legislate what you think personally is wrong. Choose life and life abundantly. Dismantling marriage will bring hurt, shame, confrontation, and more indoctrination. Forcing others to give you your rights will never end well. It won't give you the recognition you desire. That which is right can easily be seen by all. Let me say that again. That which is right can easily be seen by all. Is this easy for you? Most people know this is not right. You asked for this job, members, when you ran for office. Leading is not easy. Are you still looking for an excuse to vote for it? I'm not giving you that today. I'm here to affirm true beliefs that come from your relationship to your creator. Do you really want what Europe has? They're on the verge of civil disaster. Some have said, but don't you want to be on the right side of history? The truth is I'm more concerned about being on the right side of eternity. In conclusion, let me say this. My desire today is to bring more peace, more justice to all of Minnesota. I purpose that we vote no on this bill and that we purpose a more loving document 
that will bring more clearly and more distinctly allow the freedom of which both communities would desire. Don't fool yourself today and think voting yes on this bill ends the conversation. The great people of Minnesota deserve better than this. This document will bring civil disobedience. This document will split our schools, our churches, our towns, our counties, our state. It will hurt businesses and confuse children. More than any single issue has ever done since the Civil War. This bill needs to be crafted in such a way that it will not push civil rights back 50 years, but bring our communities together. Please think about the devastating repercussions this vote will have on our communities. We must not pass this bill. Rather, we must take one more time to craft a truly bipartisan bill that respects the values of all Minnesotans. And where no one feels they're being shoved into an unwanted world, no one feels their religious liberties are being taken away. Members, today, you must choose who you will serve. May God help us. Senator Carlson. Senator Bach. <clears throat> Madam President, just a point of order. State Senate, your point. Uh, there are pictures being taken uh, in the Senate chamber and just want to make everybody aware that's in the Senate chamber today that is prohibited under the Senate rules. The only people allowed to take pictures are the Senate photographers. Point of order is well taken. Uh, Senator Carlson. Thank you, Madam President and members. I want to tell you of a journey for me to this day in this place. A half century ago, I was in high school. I didn't even know what a gay person was. We were in a rural community, and that's uh, Rosemount, south of town here. Sure, there were friends, acquaintances, and classmates who seemed just a little bit different. Sometimes these schoolmates were shunned, teased, even bullied. And I have to admit that I may have been on, more apt to be on the delivery side than I was on the receiving side. For the next number of years, I learned a lot of different things from different people, the diversity that I was involved with in my education, in my career, and with my wife's career as a teacher. Um, it's the kind of things that we all experience, and we learn from it. Then about nine, nine years ago, when I decided to run, run for office, I knocked on a door in Egan. And uh, a fellow came to the door, I identified myself and why I was at the door. Don is his name, asked me to step inside for a moment. He said he wanted to ask me a question. Meanwhile, Emily, his wife, was headed toward us. Now, Don and Emily are elderly people, and I have to pause for a second. Elderly people means anyone whom I uh, think is older than me. So Don and, and Emily were standing there, and Don said, I want to know your position on same-sex relationships. I panicked. I knew gay people. I didn't know much about gay people. I hadn't thought about same-sex relationships. But I did have a position that I thought should probably work with these folks, uh, and they wouldn't kill me at the door. I said, uh, I really don't care. I really don't care what people do in their private lives. Don responded that his brother had recently died and had been in a same-sex relationship for 40 years. Imagine the relief. This statement put me on the road to a new area of learning. A few months later, while waiting for my car to be washed by a high school group, I struck up a conversation with a woman who was waiting also for her car to be washed. In the course of our conversation, I asked Rebecca how she liked living in Egan. She said she liked Egan, but it's not very friendly to same-sex people. With this statement, I entered the on-ramp to the interstate of learning. This was new for me. Shortly after Rebecca, 
my neighbors Steve and Jim entered the lives of our extended family. Shortly after that, Kimberly and Rachel. After that, Nancy and Kathy. Then many other couples and singles who taught me that their love is really no different than the love that I have for my wife of 43 years, Gail. These friends changed me from an advocate to an activist. Similarly, similarly, our world has changed, our country has changed, our state has changed, our legislature has changed, and I have changed. I am honored and proud to be in this place at this time and cast this vote recorded in history and in doing so, I want to thank my teachers, my wife, Gail, Don and Emily, Kimberly and Rachel, Steve and Jim, Nancy and Kathy, and of course, Richard and Scott. Thank you very much, and please vote green. Senator Benson. Thank you, Madam President. Members and Minnesotans, we gather here to answer the question, should we redefine marriage and I will be voting no I do not believe that marriage is defined by statute but by our very nature every person in this chamber every person on this planet began their life as the unique combination of one man and one woman because of this unique gift all cultures and societies through all of time have separated the union of one man and one woman from other relationships. It has been elevated and celebrated as long as human beings have existed. When religions were formed, they asked God to bless these relationships. When governments came into existence, they acknowledged this uniqueness. So as we go forward today, let's remember that before marriage was written in our statutes, or in our Bible, it was written in our nature. And so while Minnesota statutes will change today, the foundational truth of this uniqueness will remain. Senator Franson. Thank you, Madam President. I stand in, here in support of this bill. Last Thursday, I had the privilege of having a group of elementary students come and visit me at the Capitol. And as they were cramming into my office, about 20 of them, I said, you, you picked a really important day to come visit the Capitol. There's important business here. And little Megan proceeded to ask me, what are, you, what are you voting on? And I said, the House is voting on marriage equality. And, I, and she proceeded to ask me, what does that mean? And I said in front of the teachers and parents, you know, one day, Megan, you'll be married, hopefully, and we want to make sure that everyone has that same opportunity. So I stand here not as a mother, but I do want to bring that perspective into this discussion, this important discussion. And if members, you would indulge me for a, a brief moment, I want to share a little bit from a constituent, a mother in my district who I remember door knocking her uh, Several times I remember having a conversation about this very issue, and I remember her visiting me at the Capitol as well to share her story about her son. And if you give me a few minutes of your time, um, I'll just quickly uh, summarize or read from her letter. On July 4th, 2011, our son shared with us that he is gay. At that moment, we became a gay family. My husband and I had been married for 27 years, but we began traveling with our son to new territory. And with the marriage amendment, it was public territory. We had just discovered who our son really was at the time that the entire state began debating his future. It was heartbreaking. Each voter who convinced himself of zero-sum morality that if his family is good, mine must be evil, plunge another knife into my heart. No one will convince me that I gave birth to evil, that my son chose evil, or that he deserves barriers to his happiness. 
I want for him what I want for all four of my children, happily ever after. I want him to find someone to love for the rest of his life. I want to dance at his wedding. I want him to be able to have a family. I want to babysit his children, my grandchildren. And today, members, I want to allow my constituent and her son to begin happily ever after. Please vote green. Senator Ray. Thank you, Madam President. I stand in a strong support of this bill today. Senator Hall said that there are some things that are worth fighting for. Marriage equality is one of those things. And I am here to vote green. And I stand in support of that. And many people may ask why a Catholic immigrant woman feels so strong about this. And why is that I have been so vocal about this campaign and why I stand in strong support. And I would like to share with you one of the many reasons for why I stand in strong support of this bill. Those reasons are my neighbors, lesbian women who became parents with me about 20 years ago. And together we raised our families, we helped each other, we loved each other, we took care of our children. And when I decided to run for the Senate, after years of working on campaigns about immigration and justice and equality, somebody came to me and say, how come a Catholic immigrant is going to make a commitment to marriage equality? Would you make a commitment to marriage equality? Would you make a public commitment to marriage equality? And I look at my friend Terry and my friend Mary, and I said, absolutely, I will. And then I began this journey in a very different way, in a very political way. It was commitment to justice and equality before then, and after I made that commitment to them, it was a commitment to them. And my commitment to work on their behalf here and on behalf of all issues that I consider to be fair and just. And I hope I get invited to the wedding now. I hope we vote green. I hope I'm able to celebrate their relationship. I hope I see their grandchildren having children. And I hope we continue on this journey of loving our kids loving our partners together. So it's because of my faith, it's because of my background that I make a commitment to this issue. And for the first time, I would like members to say this in Spanish. And I hope that you allow me to do this. I have never said anything in, anything in Spanish in the floor before. But the reason this is important is because many people believe that we can choose the issues that we work for when it comes to equality and justice, that I can be working for immigration reform, but I don't have to work for this, that I have to work for education equality, but that this is different. And I do not believe that this is different. I believe that this is the same. So I have to say this in my native language, and I have to explain that to my own family to my own family who's listening right now, who believe differently, but I hope that with time, they will understand. So, a mi familia, a mis amigos, a las personas que comparten mi fe, tengo que compartir que hoy mi trabajo es por justicia, mi trabajo no es sobre trabajo de compartir con los demás y de educar a los demás 
sobre el sexo, no es sobre eso. Es sobre igualdad, sobre acceso y es para luchar para que todos seamos iguales y todos tengamos derechos, derechos de inmigración, derechos de educación, derechos de casarnos el uno con el otro, porque esas cosas son iguales, son las mismas cosas. Son los mismos derechos y son los derechos que me guían en el trabajo en el Senado y que me guían en el trabajo en mi casa, en mi familia, en mi comunidad. Los que estamos en contra de los derechos de inmigración, los que están en contra de los derechos de la igualdad en la educación y los que están en contra del derecho del matrimonio, están en contra de la equidad. Yo no soy una de esas personas. So thank you members for giving me this opportunity to say this in my own language. And thank you to my constituents and my wonderful friends for giving me the opportunity to vote green today. Muchas, muchas gracias. Senator Steven. Thank you, Madam President. Members, the other day I was reading a parenting website and I came across a quote that said, how we talk to our children becomes their inner voice. So today I rise to vote yes, to tell all children of Minnesota that no matter who they are and who they fall in love with someday, the people of Minnesota will treat them with respect. How we talk to our children becomes their inner voice. So I rise to say to the children at Hastings High School who lobbied me, to my own children and to all Minnesota kids, that today we vote to affirm that we respect you and we want to have a more equal and more fair Minnesota. Thank you. Senator Goodwin. Thank you, Madam President. During this debate, uh, and since it came up in the amendment last year, I've been getting a lot of uh, emails and phone calls, as I'm sure we all have on both sides of this issue. I um, got one today, though, that really, really touched me and made me think about what the ramifications are if we don't pass this bill to some of our young people. This one is um, from a young woman in um, high school. I'm 17 and I attend Columbia Heights High School. Today you guys will be voting on same-sex marriage and I strongly encourage you to vote yes. In elementary school I was taught to treat others as you want to be treated. I've never let go of that. I believe that everyone deserves the same rights as one another. I like women, so one day I'd like to get married in my home state, but my future is in your hands. I can't stress it enough. No freedom till we're equal. I'm not out yet but having to hide yourself every day from your friends and family is one of the hardest things I've ever had to do. I've had to be strong for myself, so please give us the chance to marry the person we love. Love is patient and love is kind. Thank you. As I thought about what this girl, one young woman must be going through, I thought about what Senator Dibble and others have told us about the suicide rate among young people that are either afraid to come out to their families or afraid to come out to their friends, and how we can prevent that today. We can prevent that by not making them feel like they are abnormal. Nothing we do to prevent them from getting married is going to make her a heterosexual person. Nothing we can do to prevent her from being able to have happiness and love is going to prevent her from being a heterosexual person. She knows where she's going, she knows who she is. She just needs to be able to tell her parents and her friends so she's not living a lie. And I think if we can do this here today, we can do it for this young woman and the other young men and women just like her and make them understand that yes, it is, we are about respect here in Minnesota and we are about fairness and kindness and equality. Thank you. Senator Latz. Uh, thank you, Madam President and members. Uh, some of what I had wanted to say, I, I ended up having the opportunity to say during the earlier debate, so I'm going to try not to repeat it. Uh, but as I'm listening to this debate, and I remarked to Senator Cohen uh, earlier, it's almost transporting me back in time, it feels. 
uh, to the legislative halls and in particular the halls of Congress in the 1960s. The discussion about the impact on society if this bill were to pass, the impact on our families, the disintegration of relationships, confusion among the children. Our institutions will be riven in dispute, civil disobedience. All you need to do is substitute terms from the floor here today and it'd be like reading it out of the congressional record from 1964 and 1965 on a different topic, but a related topic, a civil rights topic. Members, I wasn't just using hyperbole when I said we shouldn't go back to those days. We have an opportunity today to take another step forward into the bright sunshine of civil rights. And whatever we do today, if we pass this bill, it will not affect my marriage, the extraordinarily long hours in the legislature from January to May every year might affect my marriage. But a same-sex couple next door that gets married is not going to affect my marriage one little bit. And it won't affect my kids. And when my daughter says that her friend has two mommies and we see them at the birthday parties, she doesn't say it with animosity. She doesn't know any differently. As Senator Sieben said, the language that we use today becomes the inner voice of our children. My daughter will grow up thinking that this is the way it has always been. And she'll read in a history book someday about how it was before, just like we read in the history books how it was at the turn of the century, as Senator Reinhart talked about when the issue was gender and voting rights for women, and how it was in the 60s when we were talking about voting rights and civil rights for people of color, and in the 90s when President Bush passed the Americans with Disabilities Act, then the discussion was about people with disabilities. Members, God made gays. And God made gays capable of loving other people, including other persons of the same gender. So who are we to quarrel with God's intentions? Is it indeed that for thousands of years, marriage has been defined as between one man and one woman? As I recall my biblical history, Abraham had more than one wife. Jacob had more than one wife. Solomon had a thousand wives. Times change. Perceptions of what's acceptable in society change. There are even places in the United States where within certain religious faiths it is still acceptable for one man to be married to more than one wife. Members, we've talked a little bit about the separation of church and state. We've had some of these discussions on the Senate floor before that I have participated in. It's an issue of some personal concern of mine. And I have served on the Civil Rights Committee of the Anti-Defamation League and I have analyzed these issues over time and in my personal life. Members, the separation of church and state is for the protection of each for the protection of religion against the intrusion of the state as well as the protection of the state 
from being overridden by religiosity of those who would impose their own legitimately held and personally strong beliefs upon the rest of us. Such, I submit to you, is one of the conceptions of marriage that is presently imbued in our statutory law. But it need not always be so. We have the capacity in a democracy to collectively make this kind of a change. And we have seen how that has informed decisions in various ways around the country. I believe that if we pass this law today and it's signed into law, that we will become the 12th state in the nation to do this. Democracy reflects changing viewpoints of our constituents. And I will submit to you that in five years or 10 years, those of you who have districts that voted 65% in favor of the amendment last fall would find that that might poll in the 40s. People's views change, much of it from personal experience. They get to know people with differences. Just so that the record is clear, uh, Senator Westrom had made reference to some statutory changes in case law. The Baker decision addressing the issues that we are talking about and somewhat today was in 1971 and the first statute in Minnesota that defined marriage as between a man and a woman was in 1978, not 1997. 1978, uh, I look around the room and many of us were probably teenagers in those years. Um, it's uh, a bit of history. And as far as I'm concerned, it ought to remain in history, but we need not repeat it. One senator said today that we should not legislate what you think is personally wrong. Let me turn it around. Do legislate what you think is personally right. For those of you who are still wrestling in your own conscience with how to handle this decision today, let me submit the following to you. If your district right now suggests that you vote in one direction. Maybe it's not the way they're going to be in three years. For those of you who are struggling with a conflict between your conscience and your politics, who know that with, in your own mind, in your own heart, the right vote is to vote yes, but you're concerned about offending a close family member, or an extended family. Let me submit that you're not alone. But in the end, you will have to live with your own conscience more than with anyone else. When you wake up in the morning and look in the mirror, you will look at your own conscience. When you go to bed at night and you have trouble sleeping, it will be your conscience that keeps you awake or that gives you the peace of mind to sleep. Members, our constituents sent us here to do two things. And sometimes they're in conflict. One was to try to gather as best we can the viewpoints of our constituents and to try to implement those viewpoints in enacting laws. But the other sometimes conflicting reason that we are here is as their delegate, as their representative, to spend the time digging into the issues and sitting through the committee hearings that they can't because they are at home taking care of their lives. They send us here to do this work for them, to learn more about things, to ponder things, to think about things perhaps more deeply than they 
have had time or the inclination to do. And even when they do think deeply about these things and convey their message to us, we are here, members, ultimately, I believe, to lead. And sometimes leading means expressing a viewpoint that may be different than the viewpoints of the majority of our constituents. To be opinion leaders, to help educate, to help shape their viewpoints. It's a balance, a difficult one, and I'm fortunate that I'm not often in a position of conflict between the people that I represent and my own conscience. But ultimately, members, I think that is our duty here. Our constituency will change. This issue is changing so quickly. Members, in my humble judgment, this is indeed the civil rights issue of our generation. We are on the cusp of making an historic decision about what kind of civil rights we will live with, what kind of society we will live in. Do not vote out of fear of your constituents or even of your family. Vote out of your own personal strength for what you know in your mind and in your heart is the right thing to do for the well-being of the people around us and for society. Please vote yes. Senator Ninao. Thank you, Madam President. I think everybody pretty much knows how they're going to vote on this, so I'm not rising, anticipating that I'm going to change anybody's vote, but um, I, I just couldn't move on to a vote without at least making some comments. This is, I would argue, probably the most transformative piece of legislation that I and the members in this body will see between now and when we finally leave office um, permanently. I think probably most of the proponents and most of the opponents realize that. The only question, the difference between the two sides is, is the transformation going to be good or not? And therein lay the crux of the debate and the divide in the state of Minnesota. Right now, I believe a, a large majority of Minnesotans don't want this to become law today. I believe it's going to pass today and it'll get signed into law later this week, but I believe a large majority, a significant majority we'll say, don't want this to become law. It's not what they're looking for. Last fall they were told, you can vote no because nothing will change. Uh, but here we are. Here we are. It's going to change. And it will have an impact on individuals. We had a discussion earlier and some debate about what are the potential implications for particularly um, individuals who are employed in the, in the areas of industry that service marriage, you know, wedding planners and photographers, uh, caterers, bakers who make wedding cakes, and, and the inherent conflict that will exist now that the bill acknowledges exists but we didn't fix it for those individuals. Things will change for them. And we had a chance to try to make it better for them in this bill, and that was rejected. If you rely on or provide adoption services or social services or the various other services that are listed in the bill, and you happen to utilize any amount of public funding for those services, the providers very well might opt out because they'll be put in a position of adhering to their own deeply held religious beliefs, and this is not a uniquely Christian thing. Uh, it's any number of religions. They'll be, they'll be put in the rock and hard place between adhering to 
to their own religious code or violating that and continuing to provide needed services to the public. And I know at least out in, I believe it was Massachusetts, and I believe it was a Catholic church, simply got out of the adoption business because they were forced with that choice. Their, their law is a little different, a little different situation, but it's a similar conundrum. And they just got out of the business because they couldn't and wouldn't violate their own religious code. We can, we could stay here all day and debate the merits and demerits of legalizing same-sex marriage or keeping it still not legal. But that aspect of, of this particular bill, that unique concern in this particular bill, I, I would hope we can all agree is problematic and I hope that we can come back assuming this becomes law and address that in the future. Okay, members, we're moving in. Senator Johnson. Madam President and, and members, Senator Nino, when you said, will the transformation be good or not, is really the question that we, were, we are all um, contemplating today. And I want to say, look back over 300 years. In 1660, the colony of Maryland passed a law that said there could be no interracial marriages. In 1967, a very historical year, the United States Supreme Court said there will be interracial marriages if people want them. I say we should learn from history. People who held deeply religious views thought they were doing right. And I don't blame anyone for that because I came from and have lived in a family with strong religious views all of my life. We differ in our family now. When I was young, I couldn't disagree. I thought I would go to hell if I didn't go to church on Sunday. I'm a very strong Roman Catholic. My nephew is the bishop of Wichita and is going to be an archbishop in Dubuque. You don't get those places without being conservative, and he is. We respect him, we love him, but on the other hand, my family respects me and loves me. And I have been divorced, which is against our Catholic religion. It used to be you were excommunicated from our church if you got divorced. And, of course, I'm now married to my wonderful husband, Richard Jefferson. That would not have been able to be before 1967. So when it affects you personally, I think then you become a little more understanding of what other people are going through. We have been um, prejudiced against, my husband and I, simply because he's black. That is very, very wrong. It is still going on these days. I hope it will not happen to people who marry each other because they love each other, even though they are the same sex. Let us learn from history, please. Vote green. Senator Gazelka. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, members, here we are. You know, I want to say that I, I do stand for all people, including gays and lesbians, and yet I'm opposed to same-sex marriage. And how those two can fit for some of you wondering that, I guess that I can't explain it. Um, there are some close to me that I'm uh, close with that are, are gay or live gay, depending on uh, who you want to talk to. In fact, one of them would say that they were not born gay. And yet we have learned how to love each other and have a conversation and connect, even though we are 
very much different from each other in the conclusions that we come to. And it's sort of a reflection of where we are here right, right now in Minnesota. You know, we are, we are divided right down to our soul. You know, a number of people here have uh, shed tears on both sides of the uh, conversation. You know, if I was thinking about this, I certainly was emotional. It's hard to find the answer we need that solves both sides. You know, many of us, uh, we have a view of a, a wonderful, loving God that has boundaries and laid out boundaries for, for marriage between a man and a woman. I was raised in a, in a Christian home with godly parents that uh, poured over the scriptures, just like Senator Marty was, and yet we came to a different conclusion. Many of us soul-searching about what is right and wanting the will of God. I know that's not just me, nor just my side. You know, but I am convinced that, that there is one right answer, that God does have a right and a wrong. And yet today we're going to fall on different sides of that. And I even thought about that. What does God think about this for the side that's wrong? And you know, I've come to the conclusion that uh, he is wildly in love with us even at our worst place in life, all of us. So we're going to move forward today. I mean, it, it looks like this is going to pass. I'm going to vote no. Where do we go from there? You know, I'm deeply concerned that we are not taking care of religious liberties. I hope that I can work with uh, Senator Dibble and others in the future to protect them. And I hope Senator Dibble and, and the gay community know that I have an utmost respect for them, even though I passionately disagree. But no matter what the vote is today, it's not going away. You know, they talked about we might be the 12th state uh, that passes this. Well, 32 went the other way. And so how we get through this after this is what I'm concerned about. And Madam President, members, uh, it is my desire to be somebody that brings healing, knowing that I am on the opposite side of about half of you. That is my desire, to bring, bring something that I think we've got to figure out how to get through together. And so I'm a red vote today, Madam President, members, but I have the utmost respect and compassion for all people, including gays and lesbians. Senator Weger. Thank you, Madam President, members. It appears that God supports each side on this issue. It's been cited, so let's rejoice. Uh, we're going to move ahead with that endorsement. <laughs> also, the Constitution supports voting yes. And I believe well, the DOMA laws, we know that that's going to be going before the U.S. Supreme Court under consideration, perhaps in, in June, and those could be struck down. Look at the First Amendment, look at equal protection arguments, and that'll be a, something that could totally change the landscape, and I would predict will. Uh, earlier reference was made to the DOMA law, and I did vote for it back in 97. Uh, and I'll tell you, my upbringing was that it was not normal to be in a same-sex relationship, and that's what I was taught at church, as perhaps many of you. But time changes. I want to say I believe the amendment that went on the ballot fired the passion, uh, just a sea of change in terms of the activism in this state to stand up for social justice. And that backfired for those that thought it would be cemented in the Constitution, and I think history will write it that way. 
When we look at our constituents who are divided, admittedly, ultimately we do what's right. And obviously I've been looking above as well, but looking just a little bit higher, I don't know how often you study the murals here, but there's four women. And Cass Gilbert, you think that overall themes that we've set in this, but the four women in the corners, they're traditional symbols of courage, freedom, justice, and equality. And that's why we need to vote orange, vote green. Members, we're moving now into the final wrap-up speeches. Senator Cohen. Madam President and members, I spoke from this desk 20 years ago on behalf of the amendment to the Human Rights Statute, the addition of sexual orientation, and was proud to have done so. There are five of us who now serve in the Senate who were present that day for that debate. And there have been the two references to the 1997 vote on the Defense of Marriage Act. There were 13 of us on the Senate floor that day who voted no, and I believe three of us here today who are proud to have been among those members voting no, President Pappas, Senator Marty, and myself. And with today's vote, I believe we come full circle from where we have been over these last 20 years in welcoming thousands and thousands of our fellow Minnesotans to be complete members of our state and of our society. It was the greatest of Minnesotans, Hubert H. Humphrey, who said, as mayor of Minneapolis in 1948, that we must march from out of the shadows of state rights and into the sunshine of human rights. And that, I believe, is what we do today. I believe that the greatness of this country, this magnificent country, and the thing that we have contributed and known throughout the world has been the continual march of human rights since those first years, as indicated by Senator Reinhardt when he spoke earlier. That is the magic, that is the greatness of this country. Now, I don't suggest that are not, there are not exceptions to that. The horrific institution of slavery, the 19th century national policy of genocide of Native Americans, the internment of the Nisei during World War II. But the reality is, is that over the decades and over these centuries, human rights has been the touchstone of this country. I've spoken before on the floor of the Senate and in committee about the inspiration to me personally, and I believe to this country, of the 1950s, the 1960s, Southern Civil Rights Movement and what it meant to, again, the greatness of the United States. Senator Latz made reference to what was the legislative culminations of the Southern Civil Rights Movement the passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act and the 1965 Voting Rights Act. I've often wondered what it was like to have been a member of those Congresses and to have been able to participate in that history. Today I think I know something of that feeling. Because when we vote today, we will reaffirm what that greatness of the United States is. We will be able to bring home the words Senator Ryder mentioned from the Declaration of Independence. Let me also briefly quote the preamble to the Constitution. We the people, in order to create a more perfect union, promote the general welfare and to secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves. I so honestly believe that with an affirmative vote on House File 1054 this afternoon, that we will be able to welcome 
those thousands and thousands and thousands of Minnesotans to march from beyond the shadows of life and to be allowed to fully participate, as all other Minnesotans have, have been, to fully participate in securing the blessings of liberty. That is what we do this afternoon. Senator Peterson B. Thank you, Madam President, members. Uh, thank you to Senator Dibble uh, for working w on this issue with me for a few months, for doing everything that you could do, and sometimes we were at odds with each other a little bit over some of the uh, language in the bill, but ultimately we came to the same place, and I think that's a good thing. First, I want to address uh, the constituents and the family and the friends that I have that have a deep disagreement with me over my position here today. And I just want to let you know that I've considered for months, hundreds of hours, I've sliced every issue as it relates to this vote up and down and side to side. And I truly couldn't come back to this chamber as an honest legislator and cast a no vote on this bill. I couldn't wake up in the morning, look myself in the mirror and say that I am honestly doing the work that I need to do, that I'm honestly doing what in my heart and what in my mind is the right thing to do. <clears throat> and we have the uh, marriage before us today as the issue, and, and I just want to acknowledge my wife, Jessica. I love you. You're the love of my life, and I'm so privileged to be with you. And to my kids, uh, Cash and Paisley, or two in one, so they don't quite understand exactly what's going on here today. And regardless of whether you one day agree with my position on this issue, I just want to say that in all things related to your faith, to your freedom, to your family, be bold and be courageous, and you'll never regret a day in your life. I come here today to talk really about what I believe is an honest philosophical disagreement between the two sides. And I would just like to rebuke, and I know this language hasn't been used on the floor, anyone who suggests that someone for having that honest philosophical disagreement is a bigot or is a hateful individual that is not only offend offensive, it's absurd. And many of the people whom I care for, who I love, and who I would die for are not those things. Today, my starting point, or at least a few months ago when I went down this road, um, I, I tried to start at the ground floor level when considering this issue. And as with many other issues, I start with the fact that we as citizens of this country and of this state live and we are blessed to live with the presumption of liberty. In other words, we are free to act as we wish so long as it does not infringe upon the rights of others and that where we are restricted from doing so, the burden of proof is on government to prove why we should not be free. So in this case, I think that's an important starting point. The burden of proof is not on the individual who seeks to be treated equally under the law. The burden of proof is on us in this body to prove why they should not be treated equally under the law. And I think uh, foundationally and as it relates to the Constitution, the center of this argument is truly the 14th Amendment and the equal protection under the law that is guaranteed in that. It's an argument that we haven't really debated here on the floor, and quite frankly, I was hoping that we would. It's an argument that I believe as policymakers, if we are suggesting that people ought not be treated equally under the law, we have an obligation to say why not. The thing being discussed here is not a right to civil privileges, but really a right to that 14th Amendment, to that equal protection under the law. You know, one of the rebuttals that is used in this issue um, is that the 14th Amendment cannot be considered 
because the orientation in this case is an immutable, is not an immutable fact or that it's a choice. And I won't get into that debate here today. I don't believe that it necessarily is a choice. But as I was looking back at the history of our nation and the founding of our, of our country and, and the founders of our country, you'll find that one of the oldest protected classes in our, in our nation is the freedom of religion, freedom of people to practice their religion as they saw fit. In fact, it predates the Articles of Confederation. It went back and forth in the Maryland Compact and other uh, local colonial uh, uh, legal decisions and, and parliamentary decisions. And one of the great advocates of freedom of religion was Thomas Jefferson and to a lesser extent uh, James Madison. And what's important about that is that as a, as a huge fan of Thomas Jefferson, my, my favorite founder, even Thomas Jefferson recognized that even with something that is clearly a choice, which is, the free, which is the practicing of your religion, there's nobody that would say that that is an immutable fact. Jefferson understood that religion was a critical part of the human fabric, that spirit, spirituality and one's guidance as it relates to their religion allows them to live freely. It often guides their relationships and their very path in life. And so, as it relates to sexual orientation and what, who one chooses to love, I would suggest to you that that is also deeply woven into their life. And the spirit of Jefferson's advocate, advocation for freedom of religion, that spending your life with the one that you love and being treated equally under the law is just as integral to the fabric of who we are and nothing reminded me more clearly of this a month and a half ago in the Capitol. I ran into a couple and they were here with their daughter and it was a fairly run of the mill conversation. They were here, they were advocating for marriage equality and their daughter was here and she didn't say anything but she handed me a flower. And I don't know what it was about that situation, but I got emotional about it. I, maybe it's because I have a little girl, my little girl Paisley, and I, I'm, a, I'm a softie for, for my sweetheart. And a rush of thoughts came into my head. What is she thinking right now? She's here in the halls of government advocating the only two people she's ever known. And she's here advocating in 2013 for her parents to be treated just like her friends down the road or her cousins. How would I explain it to her? How would I explain the current situation to her? How, how could, and then what would she grow up uh, thinking about our government, about justice in general? And as a libertarian, quite honestly, I was somewhat offended at the, at the very notion that I was the one that was standing between their family and the happiness and equality and the equal treatment under the law that they deserve. Who am I as a legislator to stand here and, and through my own subjective interpretation of morality decide that they ought not be? And so members today, I vote yes for that family. I vote yes for others like them. I vote yes on the First and the Fourteenth Amendment. I stand here, quite, quite honestly, more uncertain of my future in this place than I have ever been. And when I walk out of the chamber today, but when I walk out of the chamber today, I'm absolutely certain that I'm standing on the side of individual liberty. Senator Ham. Thank you. I guess first I do have to make the point that we still don't have a budget, Madam President. <laughs> I just want to point that out. We're taking a time uh, out. Senator Han on House File 1054. I understand. Thank you, Madam President. Um, 
This is a bill that uh, first I would like to make a comment that uh, actually has had pretty limited discussion, pretty limited debate. I know we had a long discussion over the election period about the constitutional amendment that this body put forward to affirm the current understanding of marriage. Uh, there was talk about we needed to have a conversation about whether we should change our law. But this uh, bill actually got very limited hearing in the committee structure of this body. I think back to the stadium legislation that we had a couple of years ago and how many committees that we had that bill in and how much hearing time we had on that bill. And I think we all understand what a stadium is and we all understand what's the effect of that's going to be. And we had a lot of discussion about that and a lot of attempt to understand what the impact of that legislation was going to be and how it would affect us. And that was pretty contentious too. But actually there's been fairly limited opportunity for the effects of this bill to be debated to be challenged in committee, to be uh, alternatives to be offered. And it's been said this is a pretty divisive issue. I think that's fair. And I want to just ask for a minute, why is it divisive? And it's not about benefits. It's not about benefits. This legislation is not about the kind of benefits that we have and, and uh, how they're allocated and how they're distributed. And if we want to do that differently than the way we currently do that, we can certainly talk about that and we can decide to do that and we can do all those things and we wouldn't have to redefine marriage to have that conversation or to do that allocation of benefits differently than what we do right now. And that's not why this is divisive. There are things about how we divide up benefits and how we allocate them that are troubling and difficult and problematic, but we deal with those things all the time. And I don't think that it's divisive because we got some people, some group of people that hates another group of people. And with all respect, it's not about discrimination or bigotry and that there's some group of people that are discriminating and want to discriminate against one group and are bigoted. And then there's another group that are on the side of the angels and are opposed to bigotry and opposed it. We're all, we're all opposed to the idea of unfairly discriminating and being prejudicial against our fellow citizens. It's not about that. And I think, frankly, for those of us who differ on this issue, to be accused of those things is deeply, deeply offensive because it is untrue. And I think the people who accuse us of that know that. And I think as we contemplate going forward, and we are going to go forward, and this bill will pass, I think the proponents of this need to think about that. And if you're going to accuse people who dif differ with you of being bigoted, what kind of honest debate are we going to have going forward about our differences? If you're going to try to shut down discussion by calling people names, what kind of honest discussion are we going to have to resolve those differences? But I think that this is divisive is because the redefinition of marriage strikes at a very fundamental understanding of human nature. And it's an understanding over which this country and this state and people in this room are deeply deeply divided. And on one side, there are those who believe that marriage uh, reflects a natural order, the law of nature and nature's God, as Jefferson puts it. And he was, of course, referring to the natural law of which, uh, from which all our rights as human, human beings are, are derived, that we are endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights. And I think Jefferson understood, and our founders understood, there was this sort of natural order that we are part of and our rights as human beings came from that order and, and there are many who think that, that how we are created as human beings is a part of that order and marriage is a natural outgrowth of that and has been pointed out by others that marriage existed prior to law, prior to constitutions and was adopted by and affirmed by government as a reflection of that. And so you have on one side people who understand marriage in that way. And that's pretty deep. And then you perhaps on the, have on the other side those who think that marriage is really more of a social construct and, and uh, can be changed by legislative majorities when it's convenient or when it may reflect changing in uh, understandings of things and can be done at any time. But I think if we do that, we may be given for the first time legislatures the power to do things that legislatures don't have the power to do. 
to change something that they really don't have the power to do. And these two views, these two different views of what marriage is, they admit of little compromise. And I think that's why this is so divisive and has been such a passionately debated issue over the years. And so I think as we contemplate going forward, and we're gonna take a vote here in a few minutes, and I assume and expect that this bill will pass, and I believe the governor will sign the bill, but it will set up a very deep, I believe, conflict, a constitutional conflict between the rights and the Constitution for free speech and the free exercise of religion and, and what is the power of the state to define what religious practices are and, and how they should be publicly expressed and what people can say and do publicly according to their religious beliefs. And these are not fringe beliefs or transient beliefs, but these are long-standing, long-held beliefs by millions of people in this state and across the country. I've been asked many times by proponents of the same-sex marriage bill, and I'm sure many people have, and I've even heard it said on the floor today, how will my having a same-sex marriage or someone having, how will that affect my marriage? And, and it won't directly, but I would say and would remind people that no man is an island apart from himself. And we know that changing the definition of marriage will affect all of us. It'll affect our culture. And some will argue, and it's been argued here today, that it'll affect our culture in a positive way. And there are others who say that they fear it will be a negative way. In fact, I think that's one of the issues that's at debate here. We don't really know. And some would argue that we haven't had enough time to understand the ramifications of that. But let's be honest that this redefinition, this changing of what marriage means will affect all of us. It will affect all of us. I believe the culture that affirms marriage as the unique, unique relationship between one man and one woman is important to us all. It is uniquely the only institution that unites children with their biological mother and father. And so I'm gonna vote no today to affirm the importance of that relationship. Senator Sanjum. Uh, thank you, Madam President, and uh, I'm sorry I would have normally went ahead of the of the leader. I I didn't know exactly where we were in the uh, in the scheme of things, so I apologize, Senator Hand. But but I do want to speak uh, briefly. Uh, obviously, this is a pretty special day in the Minnesota Senate. Uh, take a look at the galleries. Take a look at staff is surrounding the back of the chamber. The cameras are across the balcony. The corridors are full. This is a pretty important day in the state of Minnesota. And it's a day, I think, for many of us, uh, our heartstrings pull. Uh, and they pull pretty strong. Uh, because for many of us, uh, it's this day that, uh, frankly, for me, probably goes back to 2003 when I came into the Senate and uh, this subject was with us. And now, finally, 10 years later, as the case might be, uh, it's time to press uh, certainly red or green. Uh, Madam President, it's all about people. It's a divisive issue. There's no question about it. There are obviously very, very good people on one side of this issue, and there are very good people on the other side of the issue that, uh, and one side being, you know, leave it like it is, the other side saying it's time for a change. Uh, time for a change, kind of move off the traditional definition of marriage and, and go to something different. And, uh, and we will decide that today. And uh, we collectively, each one of us, I think represent a fairly divided audience. But uh, Madam President, that's why we run and that's why we're here. And it's our job to represent that divided audience today as, as certainly as, as well as we can possibly represent it. I would say, and I think we all realize this, that there is a reality here today, and, and that is that this bill will pass. Uh, we're going to have same-sex marriage at the, uh, at the end of the day, or at least uh, when the governor uh, decides to sign this bill and it effectively goes into law, uh, that will occur. And so as that occurs, Madam Chair and uh, Madam President and members, uh, you know, I think about people like, uh, you know, Bob and Joe. 
uh, good friends, just lived down the street, uh, good people, happened to be gay. I don't have to understand everything there is to know about being gay and Bob and Joe and their lives, but I do understand this. Uh, you know, they take care of their house, they mow their lawn, the place looks pretty sharp, and they're, and they're good people. And I've known them for a, a good long time. And uh, I got a picture today uh, from Marge and Joe, and Marge and Joe, uh, in fact, uh, again, good friends uh, have invited me to their wedding. So Marge and Joe, if I get an invitation, I'll come. And, uh, and we'll see how that goes. But I think uh, no matter what, and, and I've got this, this chunk of, of cards as well, and there are people in here obviously that uh, are searching out marriage and are looking to find it uh, through our vote today. And so as we go forward, Madam President, this is kind of what I want to say. Uh, I hope through my life I've been able to reach out to people like this and and say to some extent, while I may disagree with you, while I don't quite understand it, uh, that I've been polite, I've been courteous, I've been understanding, I've been cordial, and I've been certainly people that they feel they can interact with. In a few minutes, uh, I'll decide whether I step across this line or not, and we'll find out. But irrespective of that, Madam President and members, uh, I think what I want to say today, collectively the Senate will step over that line. And as we go forward uh, with same-sex marriage in Minnesota, I think it's up to each and every one of us, to the extent we can within our communities, within our state, to make sure that we go ahead with this in as positive and as productive a fashion as possible. That we recognize collectively, as a state and as a people, that this is where we are, and that's where we're going. And as we go forward with a state, let's make sure that this state, irrespective of marriage laws, moves forward in the kind of fashion that we'd all expect it to do. Thank you, Madam President. Senator Dibble. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President and members, if you could please indulge me for just a moment to read a few stanzas from a favorite poem. Let America be America again. Let it be the dream it used to be. Let it be the pioneer on the plain, seeking a home where he himself is free. Let America be the dream the dreamers dreamed. Let it be that great, strong land of love where never kings connive nor tyrants scheme, that any man be crushed by one above. Oh, let my land be a land where liberty is crowned with no false patriotic wreath, but opportunity is real and life is free, equality is in the air we breathe. Madam President, members, many of you will recognize that poem by Langston Hughes, and if you're familiar with it, you know that I abridged it somewhat significantly. It's interlaced with thoughts of alienation and disaffection from these ideals and beautiful words of our country. But I left those out on purpose because this is not a day about being alienated and disaffected from the state and the country that we all love. I asked a question of this chamber two years ago, sitting up in the front holding up a photo of myself and Richard, who's with us today. I asked who was helped by the proposal that was then before the body. And it was clear to me that it helped no one and it harmed many. And maybe this poem is a bit of a metaphor for what's true today, because that day I felt tremendous pain. I felt excluded, friends, Friends that I had in this chamber saw fit to cut me out of my own state's constitution, myself and Richard. But my position didn't prevail, and so a conversation with Minnesotans was launched. So in an odd way, I'm kind of grateful, because we had an amazing conversation with Minnesotans. And we learned, like we always knew, that Minnesotans are good people. 
We learn that Minnesotans, when given a chance, understand the values that unite us are stronger than those that divide us, and they're so much more important. Madam President, I am proud to be a Minnesotan today. Today we have the power, the awesome, humbling power, to make dreams come true. What do we dream of as kids growing up? What do we all dream of when we start our lives? A good life, a happy home, falling in love with someone, sharing that life, a loving family. And marriage says nothing. Marriage says family like nothing else. Well, I'm a lucky guy. I've met the person I can't live without. Richard and I have a love that I can't even begin to describe. And we have a loving and supportive family. And because of our marriage in California in 2008, our family had a transformation and formed a connection. They had been so supportive of us all throughout, but through that celebration and that ritual, a connection and an understanding to us came about that we didn't anticipate. And we've been supported through triumphs and through adversity. And as a strong couple, we've been able to provide support to our family most recently, last Thursday morning. We had the unbelievable joy of the arrival of a brand new great nephew, Lucho. Rejoicing we had. But here in Minnesota, Richard and I are legal strangers to each other. How can that be okay? Colleagues, you know and love so many people in your lives just like Richard and me. Good, hardworking Minnesotans, playing by the rules, trying to build a good life, taking care of each other, raising kids, contributing in so many ways to their, their communities. Members, I've heard a lot of things said today, I promise you. I promise you, nothing will change. We are redefining nothing. We are joining and affirming the thing we all cherish and prize and value the most. Accept that for thousands of families, life will be better. That will change. We will be treating people fairly and we will be removing the barriers they have had to the full joys life has to offer. And in so doing, we strengthen ourselves and we strengthen our democracy. There's no limit to love, no limit. It's not gonna be all used up. It only expands. Madam President, members, we do this for ourselves to be sure. We also do it in memory of the crusaders who passed before us, our own president, late great President Alan Speer and his partner June, who 20 years ago stood in this chamber and argued that the Human Rights Act be expanded to recognize him and his life and his ability to freely access the opportunities and prosperity that Minnesota has to offer. I was in the chamber that day. Then I got to go over to the House chamber and watch Karen Clark lead the effort in the House, the victorious effort in the House. And Jack Baker and Mike McConnell, 20 years ago, or more than 20 years ago, so 1970, tried to get married but were rebuffed by the courts and laws of our state. Here we have Doug Benson, his partner Dwayne. Doug stands at the top of the steps with the iPad saying marriage. They're here today too. And they're currently trying to pursue their rights in court, but after today, they're not going to have to. Sharon Kowalski and Sharon Thompson, Minnesotans who over 20 years ago were torn apart in their moment of crisis, their darkest moment, darkest hour, torn apart from each other because of the laws of our state. Or my young friend, 
Aaron and his fiance, Kevin, we're going to get married on August 1st. And they're here today. But members, think of the thousands of young people or even those who aren't yet even born. They'll be raised in a Minnesota where they can grow up and fall in love, decide to share and build a life with that person, and the excitement they'll be able to have when they race home to tell mom and dad, or mom and mom, or dad and dad, <laughs> that they're going to get married, and they're going to have a wedding, and their families will celebrate and rejoice and agree to support them and hold them accountable as a couple and as a family. Members, we do this for the people we hear outside in the halls of this great hall, the People's Building, who are here on both sides. This is democracy, and they're here talking about their hopes. We hear them cheering <laughs> their hopes and their dreams and their aspirations. We have an awesome responsibility, and it's very humbling to be inside this chamber right now. When I think about those young people who get to grow up in Minnesota and get married like that's the way it always was, I think now there is a legacy we can be proud of. Even after we are long gone from this chamber, our names have been forgotten, we will have left Minnesota a better place. That is really why we're here. That is our job. So members, please, please vote yes. Vote yes for freedom. Vote yes for family, for commitment, for responsibility, for dignity. Vote yes for love. Thank you, Madam President. Senator Bach. Thank you, Madam President, members of the State Senate. I expect when we came in this chamber today, we probably had a pretty good idea how we were going to vote and how this was going to turn out. But let me ask you to reflect on that decision that you've made for just a few minutes while I tell you a personal story. Many of you know that I had a pretty unique, almost remarkable childhood. In 1958, a group of Lutheran churches in northern Minnesota bought a private boys' camp on the lake that I live on today. And my dad became the camp director when I was four years old. And I hear people talk all the time about how they remember going to summer camp in the week that they had at summer camp when they were little. And many of you here probably remember that, or your kids certainly have talked about that. Well, heck, I lived there. So it was a pretty remarkable childhood. In 1962, my dad, who was the camp director, recruited a young college student from Concordia College. Grew up in Senator Tomasoni's district in a little town in northern Minnesota. He recruited him to be a camp counselor. He later went on to the seminary and became a Lutheran pastor. I called my mother this weekend to wish her a happy Mother's Day and to talk about Ray. She said, Ray was the best friend our family has ever had. She said, in 1966, when your little sister Sarah was born hydrocephalic, Ray was there for our family. And in 1967, when she died at 11 months old, Ray was there for our family. And in 1968, when my little brother came down with brain cancer and was doctoring at the University of Minnesota, Ray was there. And in 1987, when my little brother had a stroke, 
It was Ray that was there for our family. 1993, when my sister came down with leukemia and came down to the University of Minnesota for a bone marrow transplant, it was Ray who was at the university with my family. And it was Ray who drove from Minneapolis in 2003 up to the funeral of my little brother to be there with my family. Ray knows a lot about marriage. Married a lot of couples. Counseled a lot of couples through the highs that marriages have and some of the deep disappointments that sometimes happen in marriage relationships. He felt the excitement and could see the excitement in a couple's eyes as he married them. He felt the excitement in mine because in 1976 he married me. A few years later, he came out as being gay. And his employer in the church didn't treat him very well. And he had a very difficult ministerial career after that period of time. Today he's retired and he lives in Minneapolis. But something has always bothered me that over the decades of his friendship with our family, he participated in and shared in the joy of so many marriages, but could never have one of his own. Vice President Mondale stopped by our caucus last week to share some thoughts about kind of the conclusion of the session and gave us an opportunity to ask some questions. And I believe it was Senator Bonoff that asked the question of him. She said, Mr. Vice President, are there any votes you ever took that you feel really good about? And he said, you know, the decisions that I made that I feel best about were the ones that weren't popular at the time. And he went on to talk about a brief that he wrote when he was the Attorney General in a case called the Gideon case that was in front of the U.S. Supreme Court. Mr. Gideon, he explained, was an indigent who had been convicted of a felony and he didn't have the money for an attorney. So then Attorney General Mondale wrote a brief to the U.S. Supreme Court that said, that even if you're poor, you should have the right to a legal defense. And as he explained it to us, it wasn't very popular at the time to use taxpayer money to defend an indigent who's going to be convicted of a crime. But he feels really good about having wrote that brief. And he prevailed at the Supreme Court. And today, people, if they can't afford an attorney, our country supplies them one. And he talked about the votes that he took during the civil rights, civil rights movement. And some of them weren't very popular. But how good he feels about those votes today. Laura and I have four grandchildren. Three of them have been on the floor with me here on opening day. And I just ask myself, in the decades that follow, how are they going to feel about the decision that I made today? What kind of example of, am I going to have been? Will my vote today reflect what I learned growing up in that Bible camp? where I learned tolerance, 
and acceptance. And I learned about diversity. And I learned about the golden rule of doing on to others. When the board opens up, members just take a short pause. Think about how your kids or your grandkids in the decades to come and to feel about the kind of leadership that you provided to the state of Minnesota. My vote will be green. My vote will be for Ray. It will be for Casey. And it will be for everyone else in Minnesota who only want to have what Laura and I have they want the joy of marriage. The secretary will take the roll. The secretary will close the roll. There being 37 in favor and 30 opposed, the bill is passed and its title agreed to. Madam President, I move for a recess of the Senate. All those in favor of a recess say aye. aye. Those opposed, nay. The Senate stands in recess. All right. The Senate will come to order.